Paul has been focused in the, the first part of Ephesians on the incredible ways that God has demonstrated his power for us and to us. And we've examined some of those as we've wandered through the first part of this chapter. We've seen that he chose us. We've seen that he intends to bring us to himself by adopting us. We've seen that we have been redeemed. We've seen that he has poured out his love and his wisdom on us. And we've discovered many other great things about what God has done. And today we continue in what his prayer is at the end of that expression of praise for who God is. And the prayer itself becomes an expression of praise. This is starting in Ephesians chapter 1 verse 18. I pray that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened so that you will know what is the hope of his calling. What are the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints? And what is the surpassing greatness of his power toward us who believe? These are in accordance with the working of the strength of his might, which he brought about in Christ, when he raised him from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly places, far above all rule and authority and power and dominion. And every name that is named, not only in this age, but also in the one to come. And he put all things in subjection under his feet and gave him his head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him, who fills all in all. And with that, he, he finishes this and he's going to jump into saying, and you, so he's, he's going to take this and he's going to talk about what this means for us. But here we see that his focus is on Jesus Christ. Jesus the Messiah, our risen Lord. And he talks about him in terms of power. Incredible, awesome, overbearing power. He wants us to see that and to know that. In the way he does it, though, he also wants us to revisit how we think about power. Because this is not him saying God is powerful over us, although that is true. But God is powerful toward us. He uses his power for our good. And he does that in a number of ways. And while we can think about the eyes of our heart being enlightened and the hope of his calling and the riches of his glory, and we talked about that a couple weeks ago, today we focus on this idea of and what is the surpassing greatness of his power toward us who believe. And that power is exercised in accordance with the working of the strength of his might, which God the Father brought about in Christ. And the first example he gives is when he raised him from the dead. And we know that we just celebrated the resurrection of Jesus Christ, the ascension of Jesus Christ, how he came and lived among us and was crucified. His body was broken. He stopped working. He stopped breathing. His heart stopped. His brain stopped. He was dead and buried and left in a sealed tomb. And he was raised. And he was raised in a way that was different than Lazarus was way raised. Or that was different than the way the son of the Syrophoenician widow was raised. They were both raised 
to die again. But when Jesus was raised, it was to never die again. God demonstrated his power over death by raising Jesus Christ from the dead. Now, we tend to think of death really in an abstract way, in terms of he was raised from the dead, talks about him breaking the power of death, <laughs> overcoming death. But one of the things that's kind of neat about that word dead, although it's a little troubling too, is that that word is plural. When it talks about him being raised from the dead, the word dead itself is plural. Now, in English, it's collective. When we talk about dead, we, they are dead. We, we, we don't talk about deads. We, we might talk about the dead ones. And that's what it's saying to us, is he was raised from the dead ones. Yes, he was raised from death. He broke the power of death. And scripture proclaims that in many places. But it also proclaims this. He was raised from the dead ones. He was raised from among the dead ones. There's this group of people who have died. And he's no longer with them, though he was once with them. He was raised from the dead. And as we look through the rest of Ephesians, and we'll see it when we get to the next passage, this being raised from the dead is a big deal, not just in the sense of the abstract breaking of the power of death, but also in the fact that Jesus leads the way out of death. We will die unless he returns and transforms us and be among that group. In the next set of verses, he will proclaim that we belong among that group anyway because of our sin. But Jesus was raised from the dead. And as we look through the rest of scripture, he leads the way. He becomes the first fruits of God's power in this space. Because Jesus was raised from the dead, we too who believe in Christ will be raised from the dead. This speaks to the power of God, and it's right there in the language. It kind of hides in English because when we see from the dead, we think he broke death, and that's true, but it's also pointing to the reality that he is the first from among those who are dead to be resurrected and that God will bring the rest of us along. But this is a demonstration of the power of God toward us. He was raised from the dead. And then he paints the picture a little bigger than that. If you can imagine anything bigger than the fact that he broke death, he was seated at the right hand of God in the heavenly places. Now this speaks to his ascension. He, he, he was raised, and then he was really raised. But it says he was seated. And this is one of those spots where we again see the work of the heavenly Father in this work. For it doesn't say, and he sat down. It does say that in other places, but here the focus is on the fact that God's power is being displayed toward us. And part of the way that's demonstrated is that he was raised from the dead. And part of the way that is demonstrated is that God the Father said to the Son, sit right here. Here, let me help you. He was seated at the right hand and in that culture. And the image is being used is talking about the place of favor, the place of authority, the place of responsibility. The one who will carry out the will as perfectly as can be carried out the one who is trusted to do the will. Jesus, who was raised from the dead, is seated at the right hand of the Father in the heavenly places. He is given that authority and that responsibility, and he will carry it out. That's part of the image that Paul wants us to see here. When we think of Christ, Christ, 
We should think of what he did here. We should think of the reality that he died, but we should also understand that he died and was raised and is seated. And another piece that goes along with that is that God in his mercy has said, there is something that I have said is important enough about humanity that I want them with me. And it is so important that when my son takes on humanity, he never gives it up. That's one of those things that is mind boggling. When we talk about Jesus being fully human and fully God, and I understand, we don't understand how that works. We just go, okay, God, if you say so, we'll trust that that's the way it is somehow fully human and fully God. That that was true when he was here living among us and it remains true. That God has brought humanity into the heavenly places, which was his design from the get-go. That we would live in the presence of God. And so when he brings him into the throne room and sits him, sets him in that chair. He said, this is what I want for the people I have created in my image and my son will lead the way. <laughs> and then he tells us that he is far above. And then he gives us this wonderful list. This wonderful list of Names or titles or something or the other. Far above all rule and authority and power and dominion. Now he's talking about the heavenly places. So that gives us a clue that when he's using these words, he's talking about spiritual forces. And he doesn't go into any detail about them. There are a couple of other spots in Paul's letters where he uses these phrases to talk about things in the heavenly realms, things in the spiritual realm. And that's what he's saying here, is that Jesus has been set above all of these other spiritual forces. He's not saying, now here's everything you need to know about these spiritual forces. He's not saying dwell on these spiritual forces. He's simply acknowledging that somehow in this realm that God has created between heaven and earth, there are spiritual forces at play. And some of them are good, and we know some of them have rebelled, and he doesn't tell us whether these are good or rebellious ones. He simply names them. Every rule and authority and power. And his focus isn't on them beyond the name. He wants us to see that Jesus is not just above them, not just sitting in the, the place of responsibility as kind of a peer among these, but far above them. In the scheme of everything that is and will be, everything that has been, and he'll move on right into that, every name that has been named, he is far above them. When you think of anything that acts as a power in your life or acts as a power in somebody else's life, be that an emotion, be that a tax collector, be that something you can't see or understand, but it's sitting there, Jesus is far above them. Paul wants us to see that when we see Christ. The immeasurable, incomparable power of God is displayed in Christ Jesus our Lord, who is raised from the dead and seated at his right hand and has a name and authority that is far above all of these other things, far above all of these other things. Every name that has been named, not only in this age, but also in the one to come. And there Paul decides, I'm not going to play games. I'm not going to mince words. I'm not going to let people have arguments with me on this point. I want to be perfectly clear. 
If you can name it, Jesus is more powerful. If you can't name it, Jesus is more powerful. If it exists now, Jesus is more powerful. And if you can imagine it existing in the future, Jesus is more powerful. He wants us to see and hear and know that Jesus is more powerful. There is nothing, there is nothing that can outstrip him in power. And we can rely on that. We can rely on that with all that we are and all that we will be. And he put all things in subjection under his feet. And this is one of those spots where Scripture wants us to know that this is absolutely true now, but it is not yet true now. The author of Hebrews talks about this by by referring to the same psalm that this does and saying, but we don't see it that way yet. Paul makes this claim that he's put all things in subjection under his feet, but in just a couple of verses, and again, we'll see that as we get into the next chapter. He says that this, I'll use the language because it's better than anything I'd make up. According to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is now working in the sons of disobedience. That prince of the power of the air that is now working in the sons of disobedience is in subjection to Jesus Christ. Now, but in the future, it will be oh so much more in subjection. It will acknowledge that it must obey. And so he wants us to hear that God has placed all things in subjection under his feet. And it is true, but it will be more true. And it will be more obvious. And it will be more evident that Jesus Christ, as is said in Philippians, is Lord of everything to the glory of God the Father. He's put all things in subjection under his feet. And then he makes the strange turn. It's not terribly strange, but in terms of what he's been doing, it it, it strikes me as just one of those things that you don't expect or you don't see coming. All things in subjection under his feet and gave him his head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills all in all. Gave him his head over over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills all in all. And and people who look at that that phrase, the fullness of him who fills all in all, work at trying to figure out how does that fit in here. And as as I've worked through that, my, my guess is that the fullness of him who fills all in all is referring back to gave him, as in gave Christ. Christ is the one who is the fullness of him who fills all in all. Christ is the one who demonstrates who God is to the fullest ability of anyone to do that. The the author of Hebrews talks about Christ being the exact representation of his nature. And I think that's what Paul is getting at, is he's so focused on Christ that after he talks just this little teeny tiny bit about the church, and he'll expand that as the letter goes on, But as he talks about this little teeny tiny bit about the church, he remembers that Christ is the head and the head of the church is the one who represents the Father in the fullest sense possible. Jesus Christ is the one who fills everything in every way. And he says that he gave him as the head of the church. And this is the first time in Ephesians that Paul uses the word church. And this is a spot where Paul is going to build into this, and he doesn't want to focus a lot here, but he wants us to see that Christ is the head of the church. That this was not, again, something humans created, but rather something God planned from the beginning, and that Jesus Christ himself intended to happen, and that Jesus Christ is the source 
and the authority over the church. He gave him his head over the church. And he's not developing a full image here of head and body and all of those pieces and all of those ways the way he does in Romans and the way he does in 1 Corinthians and the way he kind of does a little bit later in this letter. But here he's wanting us to see that when you think of Christ, you should think of his church. Just like when you think of a shepherd, you should think of his sheep. Or when you think of a vine, you should think of its branches. That when we think of Jesus as the Christ, we should think of his body, his church. And when we think of that, and we see the image he uses here, gave him his head over all things to the church. He wants us to recognize that his church, too, is in subjection to Jesus. Gave him the authority to make all things be in subjection. That includes the church. And so one of the things that Paul wants us to hear, and one of the things we know deeply but need to walk into and live into, is the reality that Christ is greater and everything, including the church. Amen. He is. He is. And that gives us a little hint about what the church should look like. <laughs> and Paul will dig into that through this letter as well. But one of the things it helps us see most clearly is that the church is operating best. The church will most accurately demonstrate the power of God when it follows Jesus Christ as Lord. We don't best demonstrate the power when we work miracles. We don't demonstrate best the power when we proclaim the gospel, although we should do these things. We don't best demonstrate when we say, here is good and here is evil. We best demonstrate the power of God as his church when we follow Jesus Christ, our risen Lord. Our focus must always be on him. We have been called to live in the power of God. We can't control the power of God. We can't tell God what to do. We can't tell Jesus what to do. We can't tell them what is right and what is wrong. We cannot tell our Heavenly Father, His Son, or the Spirit, this is the way it must be. All of those things would be silly for us to do, even though maybe sometimes we try. But we can see, and we can watch, and we can listen, and by His grace, and His power, and His strength, and His freeing us, we have the ability to follow. He breaks the power of sin and death and says, you, my people, can walk in righteousness because I have declared you righteous and I have given you my spirit and you can walk where I have called you to walk and you can follow me where I lead you. Hallelujah. And so you shall. We, the people of God, demonstrate his power best when we fix our eyes on Jesus and walk in his power and follow him where he leads. So let us live in the power of God and recognize that that power will overcome all obstacles. Amen.